Welcome to the Jan Musen Garden Show on 99.7 and 1450 WHTC. It's your opportunity to learn more about your garden and your yard, about dealing with pests, and about taking care of the birds. You can be part of the show with your questions at 395-1450. That's 395-1450. And now, from DeBrine Seeds on Washington Avenue in Zealand, here's the master gardener, Jan Musen. And good morning, everybody. What a gray day that we have today. It looks more like February out today. Um, we're still a little bit above normal, but, um, you know, I don't like those 60-degree days in the middle of, or at the beginning of February. Just not right. So, um, yeah, I don't see any rain in the forecast but or snow, but uh, you never know. Might be a, might be kind of a, a brisk day. We do have some wind out there, so do, you know, keep that in mind. Um, I We do have just a bunch of people coming in, buying seeds, and starting some seeds. They're getting the little germination stations that we have, um, Nanodome, um, all the other, the Pro Greenhouse Kit. We've got everything you might need to start your seeds. We have seed starting soil. We have, uh, well, of course, we have seeds, but we have vermiculite, perlite. If you're going to make your own soil, um, that can kind of work too. But yes, so we've got arrow gardens. We've got the heating mats that you can put under the the um, the flats, um, or we even have a narrow one that can go up on your windowsill if you're starting some herbs or something on your windowsill. It does help to have heat from below. It's going to be more like outside where, you know, everything's heated. And like on a windowsill, it honestly, that does get a little chilly. So the heat mat does um, does make things germinate quicker. Um, like if you're starting in patience to put them outside later on, it might be a little early to do that. But they do need at least... 70 degree soil so they really are going to require that heat mat underneath and you don't need to put a a light above until they start coming up out of the ground and have the first two real leaves on them the leaves what we call leaves that come up are really cotyledons and they're part of the the seed embryo that comes up so the first two don't count the next two are the real two first leaves on something. And by then, you should probably have some sort of supplemental light on there. Um, they do want more light than what we have this time of year. Our daylight is not um, as much as we're going to get, say, in, you know, July. So um, do add that heat lamp. And some of the... Um, Seed starting kits do have a heat lamp with it. If not, we do have um, the bulbs and things like that that you need to start your your seeds. So, um, you know, we've got the peat pots if you want to start, you know, a flat with a bunch of peat pots. I will say mark them so you know what you've got. Um, unless you do all of one thing, um, I would mark what you've got because I will guarantee you when they start coming up, they all look alike. Um, so, you know, do remember to mark them. We've got the little tags that you can put in the in the peat pots. We've got the Jiffy 7s. Those are the fun ones that are flat, um, compacted um, peat moss. And you put them in water and they swell up. And then you just put your seed right in there. Those are so fun to do. Um Kids absolutely love watching those things. And you can, you know, when they're ready to, to be transplanted somewhere else, you can just take the whole pot and put it in the soil because that's going to decompose. So fun, easy to do. Um, uh, it's a fun, fun thing to do. Um, just start some seeds and, you know, decide what you want to do. Do you want to do some herbs? Start some herbs inside. That works well. I'm still doing a bunch of lettuce um, and greens. I love that. I can chop them. I've usually got a, um, a a harvest about, you know, two or three times a week. I can cut cut more of it down. So it's fun, you know. And, you know, lettuce is the, the leaf lettuce cut and come again. You know, I've got, I think, 
Grand Rapids leaf lettuce in there right now. And you can cut that back down about eight, nine times before you it decides, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. So, and, and it grows quick. So that's the fun part about it. But you can do other greens and, you know, inside also. Um, in another, oh, you could probably start some tomatoes now. Um, you remember, you could do have to transplant those. Um, you know, those those take a little more more time. You transplant them at least once um, before you transplant them outside. So, you know, keep that in mind. A little more work to do, but you can do it if you want. You got your heart set on a certain type of of a tomato, and you can only find seeds for it. Nobody carries it in plants because there's no way you can. Any one place can possibly plant every type of tomato seed. There's thousands of them. So, you know, if you've got your heart set on one, get some seed for it and then plant them indoors and start your own. See if they're really as good as what, you know, you heard about or whatever. Um, Again, a fun thing to do. Um, Remember that tomatoes are and peppers are a warm warm weather crap so they are going to need the long days and they are going to need to start earlier because they've got you know down in the tropics where they're from you know they've got 12 hour days 12 hour nights there and it's warm all the time and you know they can have you know we don't have that long of a growing season up here so you do have to start those in the house first and we do start a lot of things in the house first but um yes you can you can start those in probably pretty pretty soon now um we had a a couple of people came in and they because it was so nice they got their garden all ready to plant their peas in and i thought well go for it it's, it's going to be like this um you can probably i I always used to plant my peas on St. Patrick's Day um, because the peas can handle a little colder soil. Um, Some some years it doesn't work, but this year might be the year to to do it. So get out there and get your garden ready. You know, get the if you put leaves on it last fall, get that all raked in. Um, Get it all ready just to go over and plant your peas. Um, You know, that would be. That would be one thing you can do outside. I know I'm getting kind of itchy when you get all that sunshine. I was out there um, trimming. Um, I hadn't done my butterfly bushes, and I hadn't trimmed down some roses um, last fall. So I did those when it was uh, 50 degrees this week, and it was lovely. It felt like it felt like April out there. It really did. Kept waiting for the thunderstorm, and we, of course we did get that one night, but. Um, it's been so lovely out there. Um, you get a little spoiled. I didn't, you know, my, I even put my winter coat in the back of the closet. So I had to get that out again. I guess it's not, not that much fun. So, um, yeah, get out there, do something. If you don't want to do it outside, you can get your, um, if you've got some, I've got a, um, a couple of the large things, um, containers, and it's long, and I usually do a couple things in there in the spring, too. Um, you can get those ready to go, too, right now. Why not? It's warm enough. Um, I had to um, rake under. I had some leaves that weren't quite weren't quite uh, d- decomposed yet, so I kind of stirred those into the soil and added some fresh soil. I'm ready to, to do anything, uh, plant anything in there now. Um, it's just kind of... It's just kind of wacky. And my pansies that I didn't dig up last fall are blooming right now. I think they think it's spring too. They're going to be, they're going to be upset, you know, once we get below freezing again, but they're beautiful and looking and looking fine right now. You never know. Um, So yeah, get out there, do something. And if you don't garden, if you feed the birds, Ken always has, um, you know, sales going on every week. And um, this week, the Supreme um, bird seed is on sale. Um, he's got it in the, it's until the end of the day today. So until three o'clock today, he's got the 40 pound bag for 1649. 
a year ago, and I can tell this because I make signage for this all. A year ago, it was twenty two ninety eight. So, with birdseed has gone down, so you can actually afford to feed the birds right now. So the Supreme and the Junko are on sale, and also um, the bird peanut rejects are on sale, and sunflower chips have also go gone on sale this week. So. Um, they are going to stay on sale for another week. Um, starting Monday, I made signage for it. What in the world was going on sale? Oh, Chickadee and Cardinal are going on sale next week. So um, I think that will be fun. You know, just Ken's always making sure something's on sale. Um, the, he's lowered the price of the deer blocks. So like the trophy rocks are ten ninety eight. dollars um, The Magnum Buck. Deer block is um, $9.98 right now. So yeah, those are a great deal right now. So, you know, you can come on in and put the, the deer blocks out for the for the animals. It's not just deer that like them. Most, most animals do like them. And we do still have some amaryllis left, and they are awfully fun things to have for, for Valentine's Day. So if you've got a Valentine or, or grandma or an aunt that doesn't get out much or whatever, um, give them a, a, a amaryllis. Um, how fun! They can just plant it and it will grow. Or we've got some that are already planted that you can just give them to them, and they'll start to grow and they will start to uh, blossom. I've got um, my waxed amaryllis is uh, bo It sent up two um, things of flower buds. So the first one is almost done. That had three bulbs on it or three flowers. And so the next one is about ready to open. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how many flowers are on that side. It's, it's always fun. And our amaryllis bulbs these year, this year, um, I've had a lot of friends that have gotten them. And um, they're getting six to eight flowers on each stem, which is a huge amount. And I've seen pictures, so I know it's true. Um, they are absolutely stunning with that great big head of flowers on them. Oh, how pretty can you get? And we have plenty of red ones, just dark red ones. Those are so pretty. And those, just the plain white ones are gorgeous also. So I'm, I'm kind of a, I love amaryllis. I love planting anything in the winter in my house that grows. My house plants are kind of just sitting there looking at me, but my amaryllis is growing like a weed. So hey, something's growing in my house. It's it's not the end of the world out there. Something will come up this spring again. So, yes, we're, we're all set. And um, got another idea for Valentine's Day is we got the most beautiful wind chimes in. Um, they aren't just clanking wind chimes. They're actually tuned um, to a song. And if you would play them, you know, in the correct order, you'd hear the first line of the song. Um, I know there's an Amazing Grace one and a Paco Bell's Canon. They're beautiful. They're well worth it. And I think it'd be a great Valentine's gift. We have to uh, stop and take a break right now, but we will be back with the garden show after these messages. <music> music you can keep doing this yeah i figure we'll do some new something new and exciting you know um, it's better than just my old music well, over you know, and over again there you go wonderful well thank you sir and um yes you can call and tell us if you like the the music here we're we're trying something different here every every uh break we're gonna do some different jazz or you know, it's kind of fun i think yeah so what's going on? Um, um, there is Coffee with the Birds. That is uh, February 17, so that is coming up. That is at Hemlock Crossings at the Nature Center there. Um, it starts at 930, and then you can come again at 11. Um, it is being live streamed this month. They did get enough money in their grant, so they can live stream it. So you can just go online um, to the um myottawa.org that's m-i-o-t-t-a-w-a dot o-r-g slash birding 
and you can get on there and you can um you don't have to uh you know get dressed and head on down there on Saturday morning you can actually just sit and listen to it and they will show the birds that they're talking about um I I found it last year they did they did it extremely well when they live streamed it so um or you can go there um you know they've got so many seats in the room but they also have another room where they've got some TV set up so you can watch what they're watching too. Um, it's 9.30. It starts um, at 10.30. There's like a little breakout where they they just talk about some some different species. Um, Kurt will do something like that. I'm not sure what he's planning on doing this Saturday, next Saturday. But um, yeah, it's kind of a fun thing to listen to. So you might want to do that. And there is a pruning workshop that is February 21 from 1 until 5. Um, you can register until fe- February 20 or until the class signs up. And it is an online Zoom meeting. Um, but you are invited. Um, they will, a couple days before, they'll say, give us your pictures of your plants that you're finding it hard to, you know, prune them. You have not a clue of how to do this. Um, and she will talk about what she would do when, and the rest of the people can, you know, put in their two cents too, of what they should do. They had some, they had some good ones at the January one. I, I listened to that one. Um, they had some very interesting trees and shrubs that people didn't know what to do with. Um, you know, they had a, a red bud and red buds normally come up as more than one stem from the ground. And he was thinking that he had to cut off that he had three stems coming up. He was under the impression that he had to pick one and he didn't know which one to pick, but actually it was, it was a actually beautiful tree. Um, and they weren't crossing over into each other. So, um, that was an interesting one to, to, uh, to, to, uh, thing to uh, listen to. And, um, you know, he was, he was very happy he didn't have to cut it all down. So that was kind of nice. But, you know, you could submit almost anything. She really knows her stuff. Um, she talked a bit about um, the types of uh, pruners and, and things like that that she would use. And she'll even tell you what you should use here and, and there and how to make the cut correctly um, so you aren't doing more damage to the tree than what, what you really need to. Um, so... Very interesting, very well worth it. And after the class is all done, she will send you a link so you can go back and listen to it again. You know, um, because she put in so much, so much um, knowledge that there's no way you can catch it all. So it's kind of nice that she gives you a, a chance to listen to it again. My notes were not really that complete. So I could make it more complete. But if you've ever wondered you know, anything about pruning um, bushes or whatever, this is the class to go to. It does cost $40, um, but it is worth every penny of it. So um, go on to the Michigan State MSU Extension um, and go on to events. You will find the pruning workshop, but you will find much more than just the pruning workshop. There's lots and lots of videos and webinars that they've got, um, every day there is something. Um, and, and then every once in a while there's a live group meeting. Um, so that's kind of interesting. There is a beekeeping one that is coming up, um, for everything you've wanted to know about beekeeping. Again, go on to events at Michigan State University Extension, um, and just put in, type in bees and you would not believe the amount of classes they have for bees. Some are in person, some are just listening to on a Zoom, but they've got a million classes on bees. It is incredible. So if you want to learn anything, just anything about that, they everything from the very beginner to, you know, I just want to know maybe I can have some bees. Um, do check with your township or city before you buy and you decide to really do this. Um, some places you cannot put bees in your backyard. So, um, you know, do be do be a, a good citizen and do check out if you can have it. Um, I'm extremely allergic to bees and I would not want 
beehives right next to to my to my house. Um, but and I know honeybees don't sting that much, but yeah, I'm I'm not really fond of having being that close to them. And I know they're supposed to be very gentle. Um, yeah, but why risk it? I know, and I'll tell you, they can find me, and they will they'll fly by five hundred people and just seek out me. Um, and I will be the one that's stung. I remember when I was a little kid, there's 500 kids outside during a fire drill. I was the only child that was stung by a bee. So it made that fire drill just really exciting for the for the principal there because that was back before we had EpiPens. And, you know, you only have you only had about 20 minutes to get to a hospital. So um, he threw me in the car and. And once we got to the hospital, he had a form signed by my mom, but um, he had he was trying to call my mom, get her down there too. Um, you know, you just had to take care of the child first. Um, but yes, so you know, the EpiPens um, are come in handy, and make sure you do carry one with you at all times. Um, you never, ever, ever know. I always carry an EpiPen with me, always, always, um, and I've had to use them so. They aren't that bad to use. Um, giving yourself a shot is not a big deal. Um, you can even give it through your through your clothing. It goes on your thigh. You can just right through your jeans, right into you. Um, really easy to do, and and not a hard thing. And I think, um, gosh, it was. I was in oh, I think college before EpiPens came out, and uh, yeah, that was that was a. That was a lifesaver. We used to have there's had some capsules that you could take that supposedly prolonged it. But, you know, when you can't breathe, you can't breathe. So that's always good. Okay, well, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about treating the Japanese knotweed. Um, you know, I was thinking that maybe it was getting a little too warm out there. Um, we, we might want to wait if if it gets colder again, consistently colder again. You might be able to cut the Japanese knotweed down to the ground. Um, when, if it's too warm out and if it's starting to to uh, germinate and starting to come out of the ground, it will just send out more shoots if you if you cut it down. So um, if it's still frozen, um, go ahead and just chop it right down to the ground. If it's starting to uh, look like it might be coming a little bit more um thinking about coming up, then, then don't do it. Um, it Japanese knotweed is one of those things that um, it is just not a fun thing to have. I was listening to a garden show, um, The Garden Plot, and it's for gardening in the Mid-South. So it's, it's around North Carolinas and stuff. And even they were talking about Japanese knotweed and how horrible that stuff was. And they also suggested, it, you know, if we get cold weather, then cut it down. Um, you got to keep cutting it down every winter to try get a handle on it. Um, there's nothing you're going to spray on it that's really going to do anything to it um, unless you have a registered um, use pesticide um, license. But um, no, there's nothing you can buy in the store that's really, really going to do anything to it. It, it just kind of laughs at you. So... <laughs> You know, it laughs at you, and you might kill a little part of it, but all of a sudden, you know, two feet away, there's a new plant's going to spring up and be even, even healthier. So, you know, you just can't win that way. But this is the, this is what you can do is to plow it down. And thankfully, we do have times when it's frozen and you can do it. Um, yeah, they didn't really, really have a good solution for it down there um i just kind of laughed and i thought oh hallelujah we've got cold a cold period they have a little cold um they like to think of it as winter but i just kind of laugh i remember my brother used to live in north carolina <coughs> and it would get down to like 50 and suddenly it was really cold and they had all these flowers that they planted for the winter and you know give me a break <laughs> they just it was never winter. They, they, yeah, no. Nah. Um, so, um, if you took the um, pruning class, you learned about pruning some fruit trees. There is 
<coughs> Excuse me, I just have to sneeze now. Um, it's really a, just a touch bit early to do fruit trees. And there is, if you go onto the extension, MSU extension, and you type in um, fruit tree pruning, there is um, a webinar that you can download and listen to about pruning your fruit trees. Um, you might want to listen to that. You trim your fruit trees differently than you trim regular trees. Um, and we'll talk about that um, once we come back after the news. I don't mind that one either. Okay. Well, we were talking about pruning trees. Um, and I, we learned, I learned all about pruning my trees. And this is the time of year to prune your deciduous trees because you can see basically the anatomy of the tree and you can see what branches are crossing each other and, and which one's going toward the center rather than growing up or away. You can see all that. Um, you can't see that when it's full of leaves. Um, and you do your um, apple trees and your plum trees. You do that yeah, maybe the end of the month, first part of March. Um, but you trim those differently because you want to get more light into the center of the tree. So instead of pruning, so you have a leader going up and, and all the trees kind of make a pretty little thing. You, you want to get it so you can clear out the middle so you can get more sunshine. If you get more sunshine in the middle you get more flower buds. And if you get more flower buds, you get more apples. So that's why it's very important to trim and know what you're doing when you're trimming your fruit trees. Um, I will make a caveat on this. You do not, not trim all fruit trees right now. Peach trees, which really we're at the very northern edge of where peach trees should really grow. Um, so they cannot be trimmed until you actually start seeing some buds on them. Um, if, if they just start to show buds, then you prune your peach trees. You do not do those when they're dormant in the winter. So peach trees are different than all the other ones. Um, just because peach trees are more uh, are more of a southern thing. Um, so that's why. And, and I learned on that garden show for the Mid-South, Gardening for the Mid-South, um, that their peach trees last about 15 years, and then you got to pull them out and put new ones in. So even they're a little a fussier tree than say your apple trees are. Um, so that's why we we do apples and cherries very well up here because they they're used to that kind of winter um, that we have. Peaches aren't always that way. So again, the pruning workshop is going to be on February 21. If you want to sign up for it, um, you'll learn just a ton. Um, she talked about hydrangeas. She talked about shrubs. Um, so, and getting all of your equipment all ready to go. So it's something to do to do to do right now. Um, I've, you know, when it was snowy and we had had like the blizzards and everything else going on, my bird feeders I couldn't keep them full. You know, they just we're draining the feeders constantly. Right now, they're not quite so hungry. Um, they can find other sources out there. The, the There's no snow on the ground. They can find other things. So they're not as dependent on my bird feeder as they were. So it's kind of, you know, I don't see the amount of birds that I was seeing before. And people are coming in and, oh, I don't have my cardinals anymore. And I don't have this or that. Um I do have a couple of tips to attract cardinals and one is to put down the right food. You know, that's, you know, if you want to attract a teenager to your house, you're not going to put out a great big bowl of Brussels sprouts. You're not going to get too many teenagers, but if you put out a platter of hamburgs, you'll get a bunch of them. So put out the right food. Now cardinals, gross beaks, they have that large beak and they can break seeds open like the black oil sunflower or the safflower, 
So they love doing that, and they love that kind of food. So safflower, sunflower, it can be in the shell, out of the shell. They love that. Um, they also love peanuts, and they will eat suet, but not at a suet feeder because this is the next, the next uh, tip. Use the proper feeder. Now, a cardinal weighs as much as seven nickels, and this is a heavy bird um, in the bird world. Um, so, you know, if you got just a little hanging um, feeder, tube feeder, the cardinal cannot perch on that perch because it's got too uh, much of a, of a thorax and it can't, it can't perch there. It needs to have a flat surface to land on. So if you even, if you've got a tube feeder, if you put a tray at the bottom where they can land, they'll be happy there. That They will land, but use the proper feeder. Um, if you don't have a flat surface, they're really not going to um, come. And if you've got one of those that cuts off at a, you know, if you, at such amount of weight, it, remember cardinals are heavier than your your chickadees or nuthatches or your little brown birds. Um, it, they're going to be heavier. So, Keep that in mind and consider um, the food placement. They like it where there's some protective cover right by. Um, the feeder that I have that attracts the most cardinals is the one that is surrounded by bushes and there's a great big tree there. They love that. They love darting in and out of the, the bushes and going up in the tree where they can hide. Um, th they really require that sort of thing. And, you know, you can get more cardinals if you put water out, too. Now, don't put water right next to the feeder because they get dirty then. But if you can put some water out for them, they would love it. Um, and, again, you got to remember, these are larger birds. So in the summertime, you want a bird bath that's going to be two to three inches deep for these guys. Um, and that's it. You know, no no more than two, three inches. Um and you, they also like the sound of water. So if you add a dripper or something that makes the water move, the water wiggler, um, they would love that. Um, and don't let it freeze over the winter. Make sure if you're going to be um, providing uh, water for them, um, even if you have a heated bird bath, you got to keep filling that up because I'll tell you, they drink that down and it goes down very quickly. So we need to keep filling that up with some fresh clean water. Um, and again, as I said before, they like to be around trees that are going to have a lot of foliage on it. Um, that's where they seek um, shelter and they build their nests. So that's where they like to be. They also like a, maybe an evergreen or two or some shrubs, um, you know, just so it provides a little more cover during the winter. Um, they do and like do like that. Um, then they don't use bird um, houses or bird nest boxes. Um, so, but they do like um, a dense tree cover um, for shelter and for their um, their nests. They like grapevines, um, tall trees, um, shrub thickets. They're ideal for nesting spots for these guys. Um, and you might want to put out in the spring. I put out. I comb my cat and I trim my cat way down to. I do a lion cut on my cat, and there's all this hair that I've got. I will put that out on the deck, and the birds love that. They come and grab a great big, and off they go with that hair. Um, it's kind of fun to put that out there. <laughs> so I think every nest around my house is full of bird hair or of cat hair. Um, we have to stop and take a break. There's some commercials coming up, so listen to that. And we'll be right back. I feel so sophisticated with all these this music coming on before we during the break. Yeah, we're taking a new direction here, a more sophisticated direction yeah. for the Jam Music Garden Show. Wow. Okay. We were talking about uh, attracting cardinals, but, you know, if you want to attract any birds, um, 
cheap seed, cheap suet, you're wasting your money. Um, it just, they make, they fill the bird seed with a lot of fillers in it and they don't eat it. They just throw it out. Now, some, the premium bird seed, it's meant to throw out the white millet is meant to be thrown out and it does, it's just meant to be thrown out. So the ground feeders get it. Um, but you don't want to have any bird feed that's got flax, red milo, rapeseed, wheat, oats, buckwheat, um, and golden and red millet. Only the white millet is okay. Um, you know, and the birds just are not going to eat any of that stuff. And, you know, yeah, you can buy a big bag, you know, for 20 bucks at the, at whatever store. Um, but you don't get a, a, um, a, you don't get, that's the bargain economy brand. It is not that good. And, you know, they don't use, it's a, it's something that, you know, it's a big box store and they just throw the bird seed in there for you to, you know, come in and buy it. And they, so you'll buy other things. Um, but you don't know how long it's not one of their biggest sellers. They don't, don't have a quick over you know, turnover of say sunflower seeds or whatever. And they might get a little rancid while they're in there. Um, and as seed ages, the nutritional value drops. Um, and it's also more susceptible mold, bacteria, rot, and sprouting. The birds know this and they reject that sort of stuff. Um, at DeBrines, we get a semi of, of uh, sunflower seeds every two weeks. So it's 45,000 pounds every two weeks. So we do a quick turnover on our bird seed. Um, it doesn't sit in a warehouse for any length of time. It, it gets moved out. So um, we do have all of our mixtures are, are good mixtures that the birds will eat. And so it does pay to use the premium seed um, but I can guarantee you our seed is going to be cheaper than a lot of places um, just because we do a lot of, in volume. Um, so we can sell it for a little bit less. I saw someplace was having their, their sunflower seed, 40 pound bag of sunflower on sale this week for $18. And we have 40, 40 pound black oil sunflower at sixteen forty nine all the time right now. So, you know, Hey, you, you can still buy a lot of good seed at DeBrines. i um, going to remind you, um, it's coming up really soon, President's Day weekend, which I believe is next weekend. Um, it is the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, it is February 16th through the 19th. Um, it is, go on to um, uh, the website, um, where is that? Uh, it's birdcount.org. Yes, birdcount.org. Sign up. They'll tell you what you have to do, but you just have to do one count. Just ask 20 minutes of your time over that weekend and just sit and count all the birds that you see in those 20 minutes in your area that you've decided to do. Make sure they know what area you're at and what. And when you're giving your um, tally in, they have, it makes it really easy. If you go online, you can do this, t do the tally so much easier than it used to be. Um, and they also will um, give you a, a, the thing to go to Merlin, um, Merlin ID, the Merlin Bird ID app. Um, this thing is well worth what you've got, uh, the money that you can spend on it. Um, you can record what the bird is making a sound. You can record this and it will tell you what bird is making that sound. Um, that is the coolest thing. There was a bird in my area that was making the most odd sound I have ever heard. So I recorded it on my Merlin bird app and it was a young eagle. Now I'm trying to find it desperately in the trees and around my house. I couldn't find it, but I heard it and it did identify it. So I know there's going to be one in my area. They like to be by my, they, we've got a couple of lakes and they like to go for the, I've seen them grab a duck. I've seen them grab fish. It's kind of fun to watch those guys, but um, it was making a lot of noise. So I don't know. Um, but it will tell you what type of bird. You can take a picture of the bird. You can just describe the bird on the bird app, and it will tell you what you're likely to be seeing in your area or hearing or whatever. 
great fun. It makes my bird count so much easier. I can identify the basic ones. I cannot tell you if they're male or female, but I can identify the basic ones. But if I go out to the beach to do a 20-minute count, oh, my gosh, those birds, I need my app on those things. Um, I don't always know what all of those guys are. But this is fun. You're actually doing something for science. Um, you can add your your 20 minutes of of fame of what you've seen. And you can do as many 20-minute counts as you like. Um, just make sure they know where you are at the time that you're doing the count and uh, in, and send it in. Um, you can go online to the birdcount.org during the, during the um, count and you can see pictures of what people are seeing. You get the kind of a, a quick count of what people are, are seeing around. It is great fun just to see. I usually ask for Ottawa County to see what people are seeing. And I'm always surprised at, you know, how many bluebirds they'll see or, birds that shouldn't be here but are here and um a great fun i've done this for i don't know how many how many years a lot of times i just sit and watch the birds in my backyard but i have gone out to a park and sat there and just watched the birds listen to the birds identify them and count them um oh, great fun now every once in a while you get a flock of birds coming in and it's really overwhelming it one two three four five six um it's hard to count them just give an estimate of what it was. Um, don't get too too worried about the estimate's going to be wrong. Don't worry about it. It's fun, great fun to do it with the kids. Um, something they can for counting for bird identification, um, and it's a great thing. Cornell Lab, Cornell University Lab of Ornithology and the Audubon Society take all of this, what you you're handing in, all this data, and they track birds where they are, the health of the birds. They it's, it's really an interesting thing. So you are helping out. Okay. Well, we have to um, sign off pretty quick here, but I'll remind you, I will be back Tuesday at 8.35 oh, around in there with Dan um, for the garden party. And then I will be back later on on Tuesday morning between 10 and 11 with Gary for the garden hour. And we just uh, talk about whatever's going on in the world. Um, that's got anything to do with animals or nature or whatever. Um, we really go way off track on that show. And then I'll be back here next Saturday at 11.05 with the Garden Show um, with all my new music, which I'm all excited about. So fun times. Um, you know, so get out there, plant something indoors, um, get it going for outdoors later on. And until next week, go green. You've been listening to the Jan Musin Garden Show on 99.7, 1450WHTC, and WHTC.com. If you wish to hear this or other programs hosted by the Master Gardener from DeBrine Seeds in Zealand, check out the podcast section of our website, WHTC.com, and listen or download for free. The Jan Musin Garden Show is a presentation of 99.7 and 1450WHTC.